We stand united with people around the world who've been targeted by terrorists, from a school in Pakistan to the streets of Paris. We will continue to hunt down terrorists and dismantle their networks, and we reserve the right to act unilaterally, as we have done relentlessly since I took office, to take out terrorists who pose a direct threat to us and our allies. It occupies a bit more than 203,000 square miles, located on the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula. If pressed, odds are most Americans would have no idea where to find Yemen on a map. Yet what is happening there at the moment will, according to those who understand such things, resonate right into the American backyard. Let's ask one simple question to start the discussion. Let's also welcome to Midpoint, retired Lieutenant General in the U.S. Army and author of the must-read, Why We Lost, a General's Inside Account of the Iraq and Afghanistan Wars, Daniel Bolger joins us. Lieutenant General, thank you for being here. Thanks, Ed. I'm going to ask that one simple question. Why should Americans care what happens in Yemen? Well, Americans should realize that Yemen is the country that dominates a key sea lane, uh, the Bab al-Mandeh, the south end of the Red Sea. And, uh, and what that means for Americans is about 10% of the world's oil that moves by sea passes through that strait, the Bab al-Mandeh. In Arabic, by the way, that means gate of grief. And there'd be a lot of grief if that oil was cut off. About 3.4 million tons a day moves through that strait. So who controls Yemen is more than a matter of academic interest. You know, we've benefited from low fuel prices lately. That would change overnight if an unfriendly power grabbed control of Yemen. Let me then follow up on that, because there are those who say that right now, because of fracking here in the United States, that we are energy independent. There's those also talking that we should basically tell OPEC to back off a little bit. We don't need you as much as we did. So when you say that, you will obviously get some Americans who will say, excuse me, Lieutenant General, we're told that we don't need foreign oil anymore. So why then should we be concerned about perhaps even sending Americans to die again for oil? Well, Ed, we, we may not need that oil directly, thanks to the great work of a lot of hardworking Americans with fracking and with, with new sources of petroleum and natural gas, but our allies need it. Most of that oil that flows through, that, uh, through the Baba Mandeb goes directly to our, our key friends in Europe, we, you know, people like uh, the, the folks in France, in Germany, in Italy, Great Britain, other places as well that depend on that oil. Uh, to, to do the things that they do to keep their economy one, running. And, of course, Europe uh, provides many of our great trading partners. So there would be an impact here even if we could produce enough oil to, uh, to counteract whatever might be stopped going through that key waterway. All right, so let's take boots off the ground for a moment here and let's put fins in the water. Might it be better for us, militarily speaking, to get the Navy in there, to get carriers in there, to perhaps protect that strait? Because, again, we're still talking about Americans being told that we need to have boots on the ground in so many areas. I think the American people are getting tired of hearing it. Well, absolutely. And, and the U.S. military has a lot of capabilities. You mentioned the Navy. Some Americans might remember the, uh, the destroyer, United States ship Coal, USS Coal. Uh, a guided missile destroyer that on October 12th of 2000 was in the port of Aden, the key port of Yemen, when it was attacked by Al-Qaeda suicide boat. And uh, we lost 17 great sail sailors that day, 42 wounded, ship badly damaged, although it's back in action today. The, the, the statement I'm making there is that the Navy's been there all along, and they are ready to protect that, that waterway if need be. But the challenge is, uh, what's going to happen ashore in Yemen? And there we've had our intel services, uh, allegedly, our special ops and, and other folks, uh, special operators ashore, helping the Yemeni armed forces. But you basically had got a three-way civil war going there. The government forces, the Houthis, who are supported by Iran, that's who took the presidential palace briefly on Tuesday and forced some changes in the government. And then, of course, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, a remnant of the old al-Qaeda that attacked the USS Cole in 2000, the old Osama bin Laden outfit. They're the third uh, angle on that civil war. So there is stuff going on, uh, along ashore, but obviously we would like to use air power and sea power as much as possible and not put ground forces in. 30 seconds and then we'll take a break. Final question here. Months ago, American officials were calling Yemen the model for post-revolutionary Arab states. Did this administration just basically get it completely wrong again? And you've got to shake your head at how they can be so naive. And we should be very careful about declaring victory when the enemy's still in the field, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, or Yemen. And this was, in your opinion, then, as they called it, this model for post-revolutionary Arab states. It was a snow job, wasn't it? 
Well, the way I would put it is uh, they spiked the ball when they were still uh, moving down the field. You know, there's a lot of work to be done in Yemen, and it's the work of decades. It won't be wrapped up next week. All right. Breaking back with Lieutenant General Daniel Bolger. We're going to talk about ISIS next and why the killers can continue fundraising. And the world seems unable or unwilling to do anything about it. And at 51 minutes after the hour, Eric Holder is about to issue a controversial decision on the Ferguson case. Lots of people will not be pleased. Midpoint continues. Back to Midpoint, our discussion with retired three-star Lieutenant General Daniel Bolger. Lieutenant General, let's turn to ISIS. There are those who say that the fact that ISIS is now asking for a $200 million ransom for the two Japanese terrorists is a sign of their financial desperation. You go with that? I do not. Uh, Ed, I'll tell you, ISIS has had no problem raising money. I think most Americans would be shocked to find out where they're raising it. Um, they're getting it from countries that are our alleged friends, like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, th places like that, Kuwait. And, uh, and I think they're even getting some of it through laundering in our own country. All right. Now, you just brought up two countries here, and this is something that I have been talking about for several years, actually. But I wanted to ask you this. You mentioned Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Let's go to Saudi Arabia specifically, though. A country that we are told is our ally, a country that we are told we are friendly with and that they're good people to deal with. Why are we still then dealing with people on a friendly basis that we know are helping to fund terrorists, and at the same time, they have a very repressive society here? Is this all about just basically putting our hand out and saying, Keep the oil and the money flowing, Saudis, and we'll shake your hands all day long, no matter who dies. Well, you really have to wonder, Ed. We have, we have a, an odd relationship with the Saudis. They are our friends sometimes. They are our enemies sometimes. They certainly go their own way. Um, we definitely need, we need, we need friends on the ground in the Middle East. We need places where we can base our aircraft and our ground forces and our intelligence service, bring our ships into port, things like that. Um, so sometimes we got to hold our nose and work with some folks that we really don't think all that much of. But the Saudis are, are people we got to watch very, very closely. Americans should not forget that the, a large number of the people who did the hijackings in the 9-11 attacks were Saudi Arabian nationals. Lieutenant General, when you use the phrase, hold our nose, in your opinion, which country is the one that will probably give us the greatest stench if we took that finger off our nose? Well, two big ones are Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Uh, both of those countries have a lot of issues with human rights. Um, and frankly, both of those countries are, are wavering strategic partners. They don't always uh, back us. You know, they, they have their own interests. And in the case of the Pakistanis, they also have uh, nuclear weapons. So uh, we got to really think, think a lot about that. We should keep in mind that the, uh, the Taliban, that are our enemies in Afghanistan, were organized and funded by the Pakistan Intelligence Service for years. Has this administration then, in dealing with these certain countries and countries that you mentioned, have they made so many egregious mistakes at this point with regard to foreign policy that it puts us in a more dangerous situation than we were, let's say, two years, six years ago? Well, there's no doubt, Ed, that uh, when you deal with countries like this, you got to take some firm attitudes as to what you will and won't tolerate. We have tolerated a lot from these countries. And it's put not only our national interests at risk, it puts the men and women of our armed forces, our State Department, our intelligence services at risk, who are trying to work in and around these countries. And they never know who's got their back. The locals there are untrustworthy. And our own government is uh, sometimes difficult to follow as far as what their policy is. No matter how we slice it, it always, sees it, it always seems it comes down to the fundraising aspect here. You touched on that very briefly a couple of moments ago. Here we have foreign ministers gathering in London. They're going to talk about anti-IS, ISIS, ISIL, coalition talks, whatever you want to put it. Are they missing the boat every time they use the word militarily first? Is it, in your opinion, should we be going right after that money and doing everything we can to stop that flow first and foremost? Absolutely. What sustains ISIS is, uh, in terms of resources, are funds that come from other countries. There's not a lot of funding to be gotten out of villages in, in devastated parts of Syria or Iraq. So it's funds they gather from overseas, from outside their area. And then it's recruits. And they get most of their recruits from in-country, but they get some of the high-profile recruits from outside countries. And those are the ones they like to uh, put on YouTube and, and point out how they got international support. Those things need to be cut off like yesterday. And it could be done. We did a lot of damage to al-Qaeda's uh, overseas recruiting and to their funding. The same type of effort needs to be mounted against ISIS, and it needs to be mounted fast.
About a minute or so left here. Is it possible now that because of the Paris attacks, the French attacks, that maybe, maybe, just maybe, the foreign ministers and the European countries now have a little bit more of a spine when it comes down to taking a hard stand against these terrorists? Because now that it's in their backyard and it's not just American buildings falling in New York City, but it's their people dying, that they might take a different attitude? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, we certainly saw it with the British after the 7 7 attacks on 2005 in the London subways. I mean, the British have been strong allies in all these wars against terror. And the French have been right there, too, in Afghanistan, and they're going to redouble their efforts, as are many other countries. I think the question they're probably asking is where was the American president? General, I need to interrupt you for one second here. I need your quick reaction to this. We only have 30 seconds left. We've just been told the Yemen government has resigned and stepped down because of what is happening there. Your reaction? Well, the Houthis have done it, and they are supported by Iran. That is not a good development for the United States. Do we now see ourselves at the point where there will be more Iranian influence here and the possibility that they will be calling the strings in Yemen? Yes, and that means Iran potentially has some dominance over not only the Bab al-Mandeb waterway, but the Strait of Hormuz right outside their own country. That's a lot of oil flowing through those waterways. A frightening Iran event indeed. We're going to be covering this now for quite some time. Lieutenant General Daniel Bolger, always a pleasure to have your comments. I'll look forward to the next time. Thanks, Ed. All right, we will continue to follow this story as the Yemen government has now fallen to rebels. That and much more as we continue on Midpoint.